My name is John Dixon. I've been working with Oracle Technology since about 1994. And 20 years of that time I spent working for Oracle Consulting, implementing and extending Oracle ERP applications like eBusiness Suite and Cloud ERP. And about five years ago, I started using Apex, and when it came out, boards to extend Oracle ERP applications. And I soon came to realize that these two no-cost options of the Oracle database basically gave me everything I needed to, to have to build scalable, beautiful web apps and to extend my database into an integration hub. Now, I think Oracle technologies are too often billed as not cool. And I'm not sure if Oracle would want me, a balding, OK, I'll say it, bald Welshman, being their ambassador of cool. But I am here to say that Oracle technology can be cool. So today I'm going to show you a voice-based skill built with Alexa and Oracle REST data services on the back end. While these are both extremely relevant and pretty cool, the bigger message I want to say is that ORDs can extend your database into other technologies, um, like Internet of Things, mobile, big data, and of course, AI. And that's a list of cool technologies, if I ever heard one. So before I go too much further, I'd be remiss if I didn't first welcome you all to Texas. Um, not sure if you picked up yet, but I'm not originally from Texas. I do live in Austin, Texas now, and call that my home. And aside from it getting a bit toasty in the summer, I love living there. So by way of welcome, I want to introduce you to my favorite Texan saying. So unfortunately, nobody in the room has a cowboy hat on, but that's fine. So essentially what it means is somebody who wears the big 10-gallon Stetson but has never actually been anywhere near a ranch or done any cowboying. And I could go into an elaborate explanation of what it means. Um, but I asked my good friend, Matt McConaughey, also from Austin, Texas, to provide me with a picture that really sums up the essence of this phrase. Thanks, Matt. And we really don't have to go too far or stray far in our world of technology to see our own example. Although it's plain to see that Ehrlich has actually been to a ranch, because he's on one right now. Anyway, on to the serious stuff. I'm not a comedian. Um, so the agenda today, I'm going to start by going through a sample Alexa interaction a little bit behind the scenes so we can set the scene for what happens when you interact with Alexa. Then I'm going to go into the anatomy of an Alexa skill, or the pieces and parts that we need to put together on the Amazon side to build a skill. Then look at some of the other considerations in building that skill, like test testing, publishing, and security. Once we've finished on the Amazon side of the house, we'll switch over to ORDS, look at a typical ORDS architecture that can support our Amazon Alexa skill and then get into some detail on the ORDS web service, um, the architecture of the ORDS service itself, and some of the code involved in fulfilling that Alexa skill. So I'd like to leave you at the end of the session with some possibilities that these two technologies can bring. I should have about 10 minutes or so at the end for questions, so please feel free to ask questions then. OK, so let's take a look at a sample Alexa interaction. So as you may know, Alexa is always listening, unless it's turned off, um, for one of its wake words, which is Alexa or Echo. Once it hears that wake word, it will then send, listen to the subsequent speech and send that speech off to Amazon voice services in the cloud. Once Amazon gets hold of that, it will convert that speech to text and then apply some smarts to that text along with some configurations that we'll make, which I'll show you in a little while, to determine what service was invoked and what the intent was that user had when invoking that service. Assuming it can figure out both of those things, it'll build a JSON document and call the REST service of our choosing. Our proxy will receive that REST request over HTTPS and then route that on to ORDS, which will start talking to the database figuring out what handler needs to be called to execute the logic for our service, and finally respond back to Amazon with the text. 
Amazon will then turn that text back into speech, relay it back to the device, and complete the loop and play that speech back to the user. And all this is happening in a second or, or two. So essentially, Amazon's providing us with the ability to turn that speech to text, to, in, to figure out the user's intent with some help from us from setups, and to turn that text back into speech on the flip side. So now we have the interaction uh, more or less understood. We move on to what makes up an Alexa skill. So it starts at the top with the invocation name, which is or the skill name. And this is what we're going to use to identify our skill as opposed to anybody else's skill. And it's what the user will use to invoke your skill. And Amazon recognize it as your skill. And I'll be going through each of these steps with the Amazon setup screenshots in line in the subsequent slides. So this is just meant as a kind of orientation. Next, we'll have the intent. Um, so these are the actions your user can perform with your skill. So today, we're going to look at a sample skill I've called Ask My Database. It has one intent called Get Database Sessions, which is going to give us the number of active or inactive sessions. So it's a pretty simple skill. But you could imagine with something like Ask My Database, you might have tens or even hundreds of questions you might want to ask of your database, like how much memory is available? Is it up? How long has it been up? So you could have many, many intents for a skill. The custom slots, you can think of those as a way of injecting parameters into your skill. So when I invoke our intent, get, get database sessions, I want to look for active or inactive sessions. So I have a custom slot of the different statuses, and I have the values of active or inactive. The final step are sample utterances. And these are what the user might say to invoke your intent. And Amazon actually uses these utterances to determine the user's intent. So this is where you can be a bit smart to help Amazon be a bit smarter as well. So if we have a sample invocation like I have at the bottom, Alexa, which is the wake word, ask my database, which is my invocation, how many active sessions are there, which is an utterance, and we have active, which is a custom slot in that utterance. So what do we need to do to put in place to build that skill, physically go into Amazon and configure that skill? First thing you're going to need is an Amazon developer portal account. You can convert an existing Amazon account by accepting a few additional T's and C's, or you can just create a brand new account. And this is where we'll be configuring our service. So if you remember that diagram, the top of that diagram was the invocation name. It's the unique identifier for our skill. So if we had two people with two skills called the same thing, Amazon obviously couldn't cope with that. So it has to be unique. One of the other interesting parts about this part of the setup is that application ID. And apologies, it's a little bit small. Um, this gets generated when you first save the skill. That application ID gets generated by Amazon. It's a 30 or 40 character unique string. And we're going to be looking at that a little bit later on when I get on to security, because that's something we can use to identify that Amazon called our skill as opposed to somebody else. So we'll be circling back to that in a few slides here. So next, we have the intent. So this is, again, defining, or the intent schema, and defining the actions you want your skill to be able to perform. So the most interesting thing about the intent is once Amazon's figured out the intent, it's going to pass that intent name in the JSON that comes to our REST service. So we can pull that out of the JSON and start to figure out what we need to do in our code to fulfill that request. So Amazon doesn't send you the text that the user invoked, like ask my database how many active sessions. You don't get that string. It uses it to figure out the intent and just gives you the specific intent name that it thinks was invoked. Amazon also provides some common intents, like cancel or stop. So if you had a more interactive skill where you were maintaining a session over time, those uh, common intents can come in where you want to just cancel and uh, not have to define those intents because Amazon have them there for you. And you define your intents in an intent schema, which is basically a JSON object, which you type in. Uh, it looks a little bit intimidating, but for some basic intents, it's really pretty straightforward to identify that. 
Next, we had the custom slots. Again, these are a way of injecting variables into our intent. And these are defined by, pretty much defined by a list of values. I just have two values, the pipe delimited, active, inactive. Um, I was listening to a presentation yesterday. I think they, you can have up to 20,000 um, list of values. Now, it's static, so that might not be that useful um, if you were trying to make it dynamic based on items in a database or something. But it does allow you to provide a list of values. The custom slot is also passed in the JSON document. So once we've identified the intent, that uh, any custom slots related to that intent, those values will come in as well. So I now know get database sessions, and I now know they're looking for active ones. So I can make that final decision in my code to respond to the user. Next to the utterances, and, and this again is what, where we need to be a little bit smart. So this is how the user expresses their intent. And again, it's what Amazon uses to determine that intent. And we're all different. And I don't mean just mean language or accent even. But two people might say completely different things but have the exact same intent. So you really have to help Amazon by providing um, different sample utterances that could match the possible things a user might express, even though they all have the same intent. And the way you set that up in, in the bottom there, you have the intent name on the left-hand side a space, and then the sample utterance. And you have your custom slot in braces. So you could have multiple slots if you had multiple variables in your single utterance. So I have two fairly basic ones that are basically saying the same thing, pointing to the same intent. And when we get to the demo a little bit later on, you'll see that Amazon actually does a pretty good job. You don't have to do word for word every single different combination. You'd have thousands of different utterances. Um, it does a pretty good job of picking out keywords and the slot locations to identify your intent. Especially if you don't have many intents. As soon as you have more intents, then there's more chances for it to pick the wrong one. So you have to be um, more um, detailed in the utterances that you provide to link to those intents. The final step, apart from T's and C's and uploading your logo, in the configuration side on Amazon is to tell it what web service you want it to invoke um, when it's figured out the invocation and the intent. Um, the most important thing to know about this is it has to be HTTPS. You can use a self-signed certificate right up until you get to the beta testing phase, which I'll go through in a little while. Um, you basically upload your self-signed certificate, and you can use it while you're in development mode. But once you get to beta testing, you have to have a certificate from a trusted certificate authority. And to be honest, with products like Let's Encrypt that give you a free um, certificate from a recognized certificate authority, there's really no excuse for self-signed certificates anyhow. So once we've set up our service, of course, we're going to want to test it. And Amazon provides basically three methods for us to test our Alexa skill. First is you could hook up your developer, uh, your Alexa device to your developer account that we set up at the beginning. And then you can invoke any skill in your developer account, even though you haven't published it, um, and the knowledge that nobody else can execute that skill. So you have it to yourself on your own device to test out the different um, variations of utterances, see how your service is performing on the back end, and make sure it's providing the information you expected it to. Key thing. Here is if you want to extend that maybe to the rest of your development team or some testers internally, you can invite other people with a developer account to access your developer account. Once they accept that invitation, they can use their Amazon device associated with their developer account to execute any of the services in your developer account. And the key point being they can get at any service in your account, and that might not be what you want. Fortunately, about a month and a half, two months ago, Amazon brought out a new testing tool called, they call it a beta testing tool. It has a couple of variations on that initial testing method. One is that you can send an invitation to somebody with a regular consumer Amazon account, so it doesn't have to be a developer account. But perhaps the most important difference is you can send um, an invite to a specific skill. So I can send to up to 2,000 people an invitation to use my specific skill even though it's not published yet. 
Um, so it's a, a real good way of getting feedback. They also provide a portal so those people can uh, type in their comments and you can get a consolidated feedback of what people think of your skill before you launch it. The last method, um, which I think is the coolest, is the online simulator. I have a screenshot of it at the bottom there. So this basically allows you to type in your um, invocation, and you hit go, sends it to Amazon, much the same as it would have from the device, except when it formulates that JSON, it'll actually show you the JSON it formulated on the left-hand side, and when your web service responds, it'll put your web service response on the right-hand side. And this is really great in the early stages of testing, so you can see that JSON that Amazon is sending to your service. You can start building your parsing logic, understand how that JSON changes with different invocations and different ways you call the service. And then obviously you can see exactly what your service responded to Amazon with. It's also a pretty good way of troubleshooting issues. Let's say your service is live and you get unexpected responses, you can test that response through the online simulator to see the actual JSON that's getting sent to your service and make sure there's no issues there. I should have pointed out on the, on the beta testing tool um, that the screenshot on the right-hand side is basically showing the steps um, you have to set up to be able to publish a skill. And with beta testing, you have to get all the way up to the end, right up until you hit the publish button, but don't hit it before that beta testing is enabled. So you also have to provide some terms and conditions and upload your logo and that kind of stuff that you would have done to publish it. Then beta testing becomes available, um, but you still don't have to hit the publish button. So perhaps the most important part here is the publishing your skill and the security behind it. So at this point, if I just publish the skill I created, anybody with an app, uh, Amazon de Alexa device or an Amazon app or uh, voice-enabled services would be able to execute my skill. And if I had a skill called Ask My Database, which allowed me to shut down a database, that's probably not what you want. And on the flip side of that, we have a web service that by necessity is publicly available to the internet because Amazon needs to be able to access it. And somebody with some pretty basic knowledge of a tool like Postman can get even lower level access to your data, and that's almost certainly not what you want. So we need to think a little bit, a bit about security and publishing, and I've merged them into one because they really happen more or less at the same time. So there's two approaches. One is to just not publish the skill at all. So we talked about beta testing. So I can invite up to 2,000 people to test my skill. Well, I could just do that for production. So I could invite, especially in a corporate scenario, where you might only have 20, 30 people using an Alexa device. I invite those people to use my skill. I can revoke their access whenever I want. So that skill is now pretty well locked down to the people I've invited. Still leaves my web service open and callable. Um, so a decent way of securing that without getting too fancy is just to use that application ID. So we get the response from the request from Amazon, the application ID is in there, it's only known to us, it's in the developer console configuration page. Pass the JSON, if it doesn't match the ID we're expecting, return a 401, nobody gets to see what, what's in the web service. That's a, a, a fairly decent way of uh, securing the web service if you're not going to publish the skill. The other side, if you do publish the skill, and if you have a skill like weather, you don't care. Like anybody, as many people as I want to use it, there's no security restrictions, how about it? But if you did want to publish it and have some authentication, um, Amazon offer a, a service called um, Count Linking. And this is where you basically provide your own URL, and when a user tries to invoke a skill that has account linking enabled, they'll be directed to their Alexa app, they'll have to enter a username and password, and this is your URL that's getting rendered on the Alexa app. So it's your organization's username and password. It's basically using OAuth, so it needs to be an OAuth, be able to provide then a token from, so if they successfully authenticate with their username and password, it should provide them a token. Amazon will then use that token to call the web service at subsequent calls. Now obviously, your back end has to be able to support OAuth, which of course, OAuth does. So that's, that works, and 
Having that secured by OAuth on both ends, both your web service and the Alexa skill, um, keeps it consistent. It's, it's a really secure method of, of securing your skill. But a lot of extra complexity in, in getting that set up. So before we get onto the odd side of the house, I'd like to take a quick look at the JSON payloads that are going to our service and back from our service. So the request that comes from Amazon to us, uh, we've talked about three key pieces of information that we need to pull out of that request. So the same request, Alexa, ask my database how many active sessions are there. I want to get the application ID out because I'm going to use that to authenticate. I want to pull out the intent. Um, so you can see there's a request type toward the bottom. Um, there are different types of requests. This, the one I'm dealing with is an intent request. And it's provided me the name of that intent. And of course, the status for the slot value of, uh, slot value of active for the status. So I can now pass that JSON in my code and make, make my decisions and execute my code based on that. On the return side, um, this is what we're passing back to Amazon. This is a very basic example, um, just returning plain text. There's a, a markup language that allows you to inject sort of pauses and things like that into it. There's also the ability to pass back a card so that when the speech comes back on your, Amazon, on your Alexa device, you will also get a card on your uh, mobile device. Um, so you could include some extra information for them to read. If your service was maybe somebody could describe a car and it would tell them what kind, kind of car that is, you could actually have an image of the car in the, in the, on your Alexa app in that response. So there's different kind of response types as well as just plain speech. You can also interact with the, the Alexa app as well. Okay, so I've been talking 20 minutes or so on Amazon. It's time to get into the odd side. So let's look at a, a typical AUDS architecture that can support our Alexa skill. So for any of you that are used to using Apex on externally facing Apex sites, maybe this is a pretty familiar um, architecture. So we have a reverse proxy, in this case Apache, um, listening out on HTTPS. It's gonna then take that request from Amazon over HTTP Tomcat, which is the container for AUDS in this case. Um, it's going to then route that to ORDS. ORDS will start talking to the database, um, execute the handler logic, return the response back to Amazon. So we're keeping the database and the middle tier separate um, for extra security. But these days there are other options. So one of which is the Exadata Express service. So for those of you that don't know, it basically gives you ORDS, Apex, and a chunk of an Exadata Express um, database for a reasonably palatable $175 a month. Um, and this is everything we need to service our Alexa request. We have a HTTPS listening out to the internet. Oracle's obviously providing a certificate from a trusted certificate authority. And we have ORDS to handle our web service on the inside. And actually the demo I'm going to show you in a few minutes, or you'll listen to in a few minutes, um, I previously had it up and running on an Amazon environment, much like the previous slide. So I had a middle tier and a database tier um, certificate pointing um, externally for Amazon to call. But about a month and a half ago, we bought a subscription to Exadata Express and switched that demo over to Exadata Express. So the demo is actually running on that now, and it runs just fine. It took maybe 20 minutes to shift it over from one platform to the other. So let's take a look at the odd service um, that's behind all of this. Before I get into the actual odd service code, I would like to take you through the architecture of, a, of an odd service. So I think it's important to understand before we get into the code. Um, it's a little bit complex, but I'll, I'll talk you through it. It's, it's not that bad. So at the bottom, I have a, a sample URI for an odd request, and that's going to get built up based on the structure above, and I'll explain it as I go down. So at the top, we have a schema. So you can create a schema that's going to be 
like a logical container for all your REST services. And I say logical because the physical metadata is actually stored in a, another schema called ORDS metadata. And that schema is going to be the conduit to everything else that happens in the database. So if your service needs to access tables or views or what have you in other schemas, you need to grant access to them to this schema. By default, you create a schema in the database, ORDS is not aware of it. Um, for security reasons, obviously, you wouldn't want it to default be able to get to stuff that's um, in the database unless you explicitly said this schema is ORDS enabled. So there's a PL SQL API you can run to ORDS enable a, a schema. So the, by default also the schema name makes up part of the URI. Um, so we have ORDS test in both cases there. But you should, um, you should really map that to something else. Because if you're giving away your schema name in a URL, you, know, you, you want to be giving away as little as humanly possible to the outside world about the structure of your database. So when you create, um, there's basically an API you can call to map that text to something else. So you could have the word bananas in the URL, which gets mapped to ORDS test behind the scenes. So you've obscured that schema name. Next level down, we have module. Um, that's also part of the URI. Module, in my case, is called Alexa. It's not really a REST concept as such, but it's a really useful way of collecting like services together within your schema. Um, I've also used modules for maybe versioning a service. So you could have module v1, v2, v3, um, and then you can give that URL to your consumers to call different versions of your service. Now, from a design perspective, you obviously want to do that in a limited fashion because the more you make other developers have to change their code to meet your new URL, the more likely they are to go and find somebody else's API to call. Uh, but it, it, is, it is an option for versioning um, ORD services. So you can have multiple modules in a schema and you can have multiple templates in a module. A template is analogous to a REST concept, which is a, re a resource. So you can think of this like an item, a cat, dog, customer. Um, you can have many resources in a module. And a resource can have many handlers. And the handlers are where the, the action happens. The handler is where the PL SQL code you have to execute that service live. And typically, you'd have a handler for each major um, HTTP method. So you'd have a get handler, a, a delete handler, which have obvious meanings. And then ORDS also supports the other two major types of post and put, which depending on who you talk to in the REST community can mean create and update. When Amazon calls a service, it's only ever going to post. So we only need a post handler in our case. So that's why I only have a post handler for this template. So again, that template is the last part of our URI, which is why we have ask my DB at the end there. So what is, the handler, what is our handler going to have to do? First thing we're going to want to do is pass the JSON that Amazon has provided to us so we can look at that in PL SQL. Uh, then we're going to verify that application ID, make sure it's the application ID we expected or return um, a 401 unauthorized. Next, we want to determine the intent and any custom slots. So we're going to look through that JSON, pick out the intent and custom slots. And using that information, run the appropriate PL SQL logic or SQL to build up a string to send back to Amazon in a JSON response. So now we're going to start looking at some code. Um, so this is the ORDS handler. And it's very lean and, uh, for, a, for a reason, and I'll go into that. Um, I basically think that most of your logic in an ORDS service should be in a PL SQL package for a couple of major reasons. One is more of your code is in a compiled, compiled in PL SQL. Um, so you know if there are problems when you compile it. Um, so an ORDS handler is basically just stored in a table. When your web service is invoked, it pulls that text out of the table and executes that as an anon anonymous block. So if you have any errors in that code, you're only ever going to find out at runtime. 
Now, I know you're going to test it beforehand, so it's unlikely you're going to have errors, but it's still more code you can put in compiled logic, the more you'll know if you've introduced problems sooner. Perhaps the more important reason, though, is reuse. So if we have all our code in our PL SQL package, we can then potentially call that code from other places, so we're not having to um, copy that code all over the place, especially in that scenario where we were talking about having different versions of code in different modules. We would have to um, replicate this handler logic in every module, and the less code we're having to replicate, the better. So what's the handler actually doing? Well, first thing is going to get a bind variable. So ORDS will send you a bind variable, which is the payload that Amazon has sent, and it will send that in a, a blob format. So we're going to grab that blob from the bind variable and then call our API. Our API is going to do its thing, return back a status and some text. Um, that status we're going to use as the HTTP response status. So you know, the 200 OK, 201 created, those statuses that we're familiar with from using the web. And we're going to return that status in the response bind variable of status, which will Amazon will receive as whether um, that was successful or not. And then if anything bad happens, we're just going to return a bad request response at the end. Now in reality, we're talking with the machine here, so the machine doesn't really care why it failed. But if you're publishing an API that other developers are going to consume, you want to be a bit more elegant than that in your response. So you'd respond with a 400, so I know something went wrong, but you'd also put something in the response body to tell that developer what went wrong and more importantly, how they can fix it. I think it's important when building REST services to treat them a little bit like a UI and, and think about the design, especially in the response, because um, developers, as many of you here are developers, um, fickle people, if they can find a service that gives them better error messages, then they'll move on to that, that next service. So you really do need to think about that. Yes, sorry. Um, you basically, I'll, I'll show you in a few seconds here, but you can do basically do HTTP.p, um, and that will output whatever you put inside it back into the response. So then this is our, our main API. Um, so it's going to assume success to start with, unless something else bad happens, and we'll change that. First thing it's going to do is convert that blob to a clob, um, because our next step, which is to pass the JSON, relies on that being a clob. Um, the Apex JSON API at the bottom of the screen there, introduced, I think, about Apex 5, is a really nice way of passing JSON. It does a, a good job of that. And it gives you back a structure that you can then look at in PL SQL, which we'll see coming up here. So now that we have a JSON document passed, we can start pulling attributes out, and the first thing we talked about doing was checking the application ID. So I'll pull out the application ID, check it against, in this case, a global constant that's in the package, probably should be in the table, obviously. And if it doesn't match, then I'm going to return a 401 and a, a vague error message. So this is one area where you don't want to be too explicit about helping them figure out how they couldn't log into your service. Because <laughs> um, if they don't know how to log in, they probably shouldn't be trying to start with. So assuming we get past that, whoops, too, much, too far. OK, I'm going to manual mode. Assuming we get past that, we now need to look figure out what the, the intent was. So there are different intent types, like I discussed. So I'm first figuring out what the intent type was. And if it's an intent request, um, sorry, request type. If it's an intent request, I'm going to then pull out the intent name from the JSON. And if it matches a specific value, so I'm interested in get database sessions in my code, then I'm going to call a function. That function, which we'll get onto in a little bit, returns the, um, what we're going to send back to Amazon. So now we're right at the core of the, uh, the, core of the solution now. We've been through a bunch of configurations on the Amazon side. We've created our ORDS architecture. We understand how ORDS is put together. We've created our handler. This is the actual code that's going to run and do what we wanted it to do. 
Um, now we know the intent, we know what slot values to look for. So I'm going to pull out the status slot value. And if it's not matching one of the ones I was expecting, I want to return a friendly response so that the user knows what slot values are valid. And I think this is probably a good time to bring in Alexa so we can see this in action a little bit. Hopefully it's loud enough. So I'm going to start by testing that, that first test case where it's not active or inactive. So Alexa, ask my database how many blue sessions are there? Sorry, I do not recognize the session status blue. Valid statuses are active or inactive. So the neat that thing there is it actually recognized that there was a slot value, and it wasn't the one we wanted, but it's useful to replay that to the user so they know what we thought they said. And then we also said what we think they should say. So it basically executed that code. Now I know this is the database track, and after having worked with Oracle DBAs for 20 years or so, I should know, better, <coughs> should know better than advertising the code I use to count the number of database sessions, because it's probably horribly wrong and embarrassingly wrong if the DBA is looking at that, excuse me. Um, but at least it gives me a count that changes from time to time, so that's cool. So let's test out the, the happy path here. And Alexa, ask my database how many active sessions are there? There are currently 95 active sessions. And that's a, a bit of an insight into Exadata Express. Um, I don't know if um, you heard Colm Divley's session yesterday on how Oracle has architected Exadata Express. He was talking about them sharing the JDBC connection pool across all the PDBs. So I'm assuming that's the number of active sessions they've got running in that connection pool, but I might be wrong. Anyway, um, so the reverse of that is inactive. So Alexa, ask my database how many inactive sessions are there? Or don't, I don't care. Alexa, ask my database how many inactive sessions are there? There are currently one inactive sessions. So just the one. So we talked about utterances a bit earlier on, and I said Amazon does a pretty decent job of picking out your intent, even if you don't put every combination of every word for every utterance. So I wanted to just illustrate that a little bit. So Alexa, ask my database, bananas, active sessions are there? There are currently 95 active sessions. So obviously I don't have the word bananas in my sample, utter uh, sample utterance, but it's figured out, I had the word sessions, there was a slot value in more or less the right place, so it's identified the intent. You don't say ask for that. that. Yeah, that's my invocation name for my skill, so then it just wouldn't, it wouldn't know which skill to call, basically. So what if you said how many sessions there are? It would probably not do very well at that. Well, it might do, let's try it. I want to ask. Alexa, ask my database. How many total sessions are there? She's going to say, I don't know Sorry, total. I do not recognize the session status total. Valid statuses are active or inactive. So it's in. Yeah, so it's seeing total as a slot value. And I'm testing that I'm only going to say it's valid if it's active or inactive. So I could have put that in there. I could have put it in my logic. Um, if it's equal to total, then put an NVL around the status and give them back the total, if you know what I mean. The question was, uh, if you need the slot value, you said that you didn't oh. you said how many sessions. Alexa, ask my database how many sessions are there. There are currently zero sessions. And I'll tell you why that's happening. It's because my code is bad, and the slot value is coming in null. So my if statement is not recognizing null, obviously, so it's skipping right through that to the code, and it's getting a count of zero. So that's bad programming. But thanks for pointing that out. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on swiftly, the last thing we want to do is um, we're going to build a JSON response, send it back to Amazon, basically. And so we're going to 
back to our Apex JSON API to build up that response. It's going to pull out the status. And then that's to your question, there's a HTTP.p at the end, which is going to put that, that response out into the response body. So we built a skill. We have something more or less working. Um, I'm going to mute this. I wanted to finish by going through some possibilities that is, these technologies open up to us. And I'll prefix this with my, um, my imagine. This is based on my imagination, which is limited to pretty much 20 years of ERP implementations. So um, that's my imagination for you. But um, I encourage you to sort of look outside my imagination and just look at this as a starting point to, to what you think might be possible. So from my imagination perspective, why not voice enable your ERP applications? So for something like EBS, you have an Oracle database, so you have much of what you would need um, in place already. You just need ORDs and, and those settings that we talked about. And actually, I've been talking to a customer recently who wants to provide their CFO with an Alexa skill to give um, a daily revenue briefing. So this customer has Oracle EBS. They're extensive users of ORDs. They have over 20 ORD services servicing internal and external systems. So they have most of the infrastructure they need to do this. They basically, like I say, just need the Amazon setups and to punch a hole in the firewall, which is probably the most complicated and time-consuming part of all of that with IT security. Um, but from that, you can start to imagine some of the scenarios. So I'd like to take you through a few of them. So the first one is our CFO. So he's rolled into work, it's 9.30 in the morning. Um, his PA's been dispatched to grab his morning latte from Starbucks. And he figures he'd better be a bit informed about revenue today because he's got a golf game with the CFO, CEO this afternoon. Um, so, anyway, so Alexa, we, he calls the service, Alexa dips into his database. So it's now got, as long as you give appropriate permissions, access to all the data in EBS. So it can count or get a total of revenue for yesterday. Get a total of revenue day over day from yesterday to the day before. Total revenue by region, top five customers by revenue. You get it, he, he gets a, basically a daily briefing. And I, for those of you who are familiar with Alexa, you can get your daily BBC News briefing or what have you. And he can consume it in much the same way. So he's sitting there having his coffee, um, figuring out why he was slicing the ball last week and being told about the revenue situation for his company so he can appear in forms. So it's a really nice way to consume thing, uh, information while you're doing something else at the same time. Um, the other scenario, it could be a sales guy. It's also 9.30 in the morning. He's on his way to his first um, sales call of the day. He didn't get time to do much research on this customer because he was at a customer dinner last night. And maybe he was an Oracle sales guy, I don't know. Um, but he turns to his trusty Alexa-enabled car and asks for an update on the company he's going to visit that day. So it dips into Oracle EBS again, looks at the quotes that are outstanding for that customer. So he knows what deals he's got to close that day. Maybe it looks at the total sales for the last month so he knows how big a discount he's going to have to give them. Maybe it even looks into the number of returns or even looks into Oracle service to see the critical SRs that are in place. So he knows what kind of beating he's going to take. Either way, he's going to show up more informed. <coughs> and the final scenario is our trusty warehouse inventory manager. He's at work at 7.30 in the morning. He certainly didn't get invited to the customer dinner last night. He's trying to figure out how many widgets he needs to order for next week's production run. So he asks his Alexa service. It could dip into some basic information like how much is on hand for that item. It could look at previous sales and trends. Or if for more evolved companies, it could look at the forecast and actually tell him how much he needs to reorder for that particular item. So there's millions and millions of records basically in an Oracle database of information and an EBS database, for example, of information that you can get at. The last thing, um, that's kind of limiting to us to an EBS world. If we look a little bit beyond that, and there's a useful API that Apex provides called Apex Web Service, why not expand that? 
So I've called into my Oracle database. I've got some stuff out of EBS. But why not also call out to Cloud ERP, get some information about headcount from HR in the cloud, reach out to Salesforce, get some information out of Salesforce, even Twitter, and consolidate all that back into a daily briefing for somebody in your organization. Using that method, there's really no inside or internally or externally, there's really no limit to where you can start pulling your information from and consolidating that into a response on the Alexa device. Um, how am I doing for time? Not, no, I'm doing okay. So that expands the scenarios we could look at. So now you might have the CEO um, who wants a, a corporate briefing. So it's dipping into EBS for financials maybe Salesforce for some um, sales information, maybe an SAP environment for some acquisition company, some information of an acquisition company, or even internal systems for accident counts, that kind of thing. So you, you see what I'm saying? You can start now consoli consolidating data from all over the place. And finally, you have the marketing, the CMO. So he's looking maybe in Oracle Marketing Cloud, maybe looking at trends in Twitter, and being able to consolidate responses from all those different areas. So that's it for me doing the talking. Again, I appreciate your time in attending this session. Um, does everybody, anyone have any questions? Um, yeah, so the question was, would this, um, with awards basically work only with Alexa? So awards, basically, you can expose a REST service. So anything that will work with a REST service. I haven't tried Google Home, but I'm almost certain they would be using REST services on the back end. So yeah, it should should work with any of those services. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a possibility of Alexa asking follow-up questions rather than like a multi-part question? Yeah. Yeah. There's different intent requests. So uh, sorry, request types, and you can sort of maintain a session. So one of the um, I'm not sure I can get back to it here. The JSON document. So basically, the question um, was can you have a more interactive experience with Alexa rather than just having a the daily briefing? Um, so I obviously opted to do the easiest, which is just do that, but you can do it. So you see at the top there's a session ID. So you can maintain that. So you'd basically store that and you can maintain a conversation with Alexa. Um, somebody did a, a great demo yesterday where they were pulling data out of an Oracle database, not using ORDS, but they had an interactive conversation with Alexa, querying data and, and you basically kind of keep the Alexa open, so you say open, and then the skill name, and it kind of stays open. You can keep asking it questions and responding throughout a session. And that session ID helps you, on your web service side, maintain the context of that session. Yes? Um, the question was, was it possible to do machine learning with Alexa and ORDS? So it's certainly, um, again, ORDS is great at exposing REST services. So I guess if you had something like um, a Watson service that could plug into a REST service, like Watson does a lot of machine learning stuff in the cloud for you. Um, I, I really don't know how that works. But again, ORDS is a REST service. 99% so of the world talks to REST, so it should. Um, and you can be as smart or not smart as you like in your code. So you can make your code more evolved. So it, gives them more intelligent responses, but um, I guess my short answer is I'm not sure. Sorry, you had a question. Um, yeah, there is, there is an app. Um, so Amazon recently exposed their stuff as Amazon Voice Services. So there's an API. They've exposed the whole API. And there is, I forget the name of the app again. The guy yesterday did a better job than me at explaining the different ways you can interact. But there's a, an app you can um, download that basically acts like an Alexa on your phone. So there is an Alexa app that you use to configure your Alexa device and stuff like that. But that doesn't allow you to talk to it. But there's a third party that's created an app that allows you to talk through Amazon voice services <coughs> as if it was an Alexa device. So yeah. And also cars, you know, auto manufacturers are starting to integrate Alexa into cars. But which pretty useful when that happens too. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Um, do you find there's one particular stack that fits better with Alexa? 
over another, like what motivated you to choose a solid you know, Apache uh, yeah, just just my history. Yeah, I mean, I've, I when I've typically, um, you know, my, as part of my background is sort of setting up environments for people to on Apex. Um, so I've used Glassfish as a container for ORDs. With I mostly used Apache just because that's what I know. Um, but as long as you have a HTTP endpoint, it could be any web server, and the reverse proxy could be any proxy. It's just trying to keep it secure. There's no. I haven't tried other ones. So I don't know if any other ones are faster. The, the real delay is in um, the communication with, um, like I have noticed the Exadata Express is slightly slower than our Amazon environment was. So that's where the delay is going to happen, I think, in, in that area. But, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks.